สวัสดีค่ะ Welcome to the second live streaming interview sessions of day one of this 22nd Bangkok International Symposium on HIV medicine. Once again, I am Patri r a k s a w o n g Now um, we are going to go straight into the interviews. We'll be focusing on prep. Ten minutes. Dan Nitya is here with us. Dan, Dr. Nitya Panupak, Chief of Search. At the prevention unit of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. So once again, we're going to focus on prep for the next couple of minutes. Four topics altogether, and we'll begin with Thailand's road to universal coverage of prep. I would like to bring on stage here uh, Professor Tui Sap s i r a p r a p a s i r i Director of the National AIDS Management Center, Department of Disease Control at the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand. สวัสดีค่ะ So we're ready to squeeze out more information from you, and we don't have much time, as I do believe that you have to rush off. But we do appreciate your presence, so I'll leave it to Dr. Nitya to yes. pose the questions to you. Um, I think um, we have been proud as being Thai uh, to be able to say that our country is considering, even though it's like provisional approval of um, having prep under our universal health coverage, and and I think uh, we have learned quite a lot from um, the challenges that m a j a n t u i s a shared with us here today. And I think it would be very useful for other countries um, to learn um, how you think that uh, we can frame the. Uh, condom use concern and STI um, concern um, with the rollout or the scale up of prep um, in the countries in a way that um, it gives um, the policy makers in the country um, the 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 com comfortable feeling that we are not leaving STI or condom use behind when we are talking about prep scale up. Okay, so as we know that uh, prep is effective for HIV prevention. Not for STI. Uh, when we integrate uh, PrEP into the HIV program, there are a lot of questions or concerns about the resurgence of STI, and also whether it will uh, deteriorate the condom programming. However, if we look at this carefully, this is not the uh, problem or challenging or barrier to uh, include PrEP for additional prevention. But it actually the opportunity for us to improve the uh, STI programming and screening because if we look at that uh, the problem of STI uh, issue is that this is the co-infection of people who uh, receive the HIV prevention. They have both STI or they might list for STI and HIV. So actually, we have to strengthening to screen them. And improve them in uh, to the services. So the HIV program will work closely with the STI and integrate the screening services, as well as provide the treatment of STI to to all. And the other issue is that uh, PrEP is not to replace the success of condom program. Mm -hmm. It's the combination. It's the complement. Uh, for those who are not comfortable or not able to use condom, so this would be the additional tool for them for HIV prevention. So actually, this is the good opportunity that we would uh, strengthen in the HIV prevention as well as extend the prevention to the STI program, not to uh, make the problem. I believe that um, by hearing this, um, many people are still concerning, um, probably not from the policy maker view, but uh, from the implementers' uh, view. That uh, if we are uh, saying that um, prep is always with condom. Are we deferring away those who are actually are the target population for prep by saying that if you are taking prep, you will need to use condom as well? But they are not using condom anyway. Uh, will will they be not seen as target or, or seeing themselves as someone who uh, should come in and access prep service that we are now offering for free? Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, it's not. To target only those who do not use condom, 
uh, even those who use PrEP will receive the education on condom use. Because uh, when we're talking about the uh, infection when you have unprotected sex, it's not only the HIV but for STI. So actually you might uh, consider this is the double protection that you, if you use both condom and PrEP, you would be able to protect both. Mm -hmm. And so it's the way that uh, we have to look at uh, PrEP is not the additional tools for those who are not comfortable to use condom, but it's also make benefit to those who already use condom that would uh, make the people uh, double protection as well as to get uh, more education and uh, to be more safer in behavior. So I, I think the last question here uh, would be around um, how you see um, the Royal Thai government um, as the leader in this region in, in getting prep uh, in, into a tangible action of, of how it could be seen as a um, combination HIV prevention package for the country to um, say something to other countries who are thinking of how they are uh, going to scale up prep in their countries. Uh, our message would be that our experience is on the way, but we are happy to uh, share what we have faced, and we encourage that during this uh, critical part, uh, HIV is uh, during the last mile of uh, ending AIDS. This is the critical point that we have to use uh, effective tools together and to uh, make this uh, access to all, not only to those who are able to list the services, but there are some people who may left behind. So the, the law of the government is to ensure that those who need, whether they are in uh, different area, whether they are poor, whether they are stigmatized, they should be able to access to the effectiveness services uh, to prevent and to living in the quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. Very Thank you very much indeed for Thank your you. precious time. Thank you. We are just talking here to Dr. Tawi Sapsira Prapa Siri. Uh, he's the director of National AIDS Management Center here at the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand. Now, what is so key is continuing to scale up prep, but at the same time, we cannot push away the, uh, the traditional methods, and that still needs to be implemented. And um, also very important is that education remains very, very key to preventing the spread of AIDS, etc. Once again, thank you thank very you. much for, for being here with us on this live streaming program. We thank will you. continue to focus on um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. We're now going to get an overview of PrEP implementation <laughs> models now. Earlier inside the main plenary session, we heard from Dr. Toshi Bumi Taniguchi, who is from the Department of Infectious Diseases in Chiba University, or at Chiba University in Japan. So, Wadika, he joins us now to tell us more. Yes, absolutely. Yes, um, I think that everyone is so envious about um, how you uh, have traveled to so many yes. um, places in the world uh, who are, uh, to, to, to the clinics um, who are like, um, demonstrating all these um, best practice uh, for PrEP implementation. Um, I would like to start by asking you um, which models, it could be multiple models, um, do you think that um, it would really um, speed up um, PrEP implementation in countries in our region um, which is which are hardly hit by HIV, um, and, and uh, for example, uh, the Philippines, the Indonesia, um, and, and lastly, like in your own country, uh, which models do, do you think um, would be the best way to go? So during my presentation, I've shown uh, models like from London, San Francisco, uh, Melbourne, which is Western country, and they have lots of resources. Now, I don't think that is applicable to many countries in Asia. So I like the Thai model, which has a key population led uh, prep. And uh, I think 
uh, demedicalizing PrEP or HIV testing is a key component for success uh, in uh, uh, PrEP scaling up in Thailand, as well as other uh, countries in Asia. Now, uh, in Japan, we have a different problem. So uh, we have a problem that the policy maker is not really supporting much to uh, scale up PrEP or even start initiate PrEP. So at this moment, we're kind of like struggling with that. Uh, but the key population that PrEP is very strong, demedicalizing PrEP is a very key component, I think. So I'm really jealous of you who uh, started the key population that PrEP. The key word around the demedicalization of PrEP is something that is very interesting. Um, would you be able to like um, clarify on that um, point a little bit more on, on what you see could be potential um, demedicalizing um, activities that we could start right away in, in, in countries in the region? Yeah, so I consider uh, HIV prevention very similar to contraception. So uh, giving PrEP is like giving oral contraceptives. So uh, when we talk about contraception, we don't only talk about oral contraceptives, right? Uh, I mean, you have various methods, condom, uh, diaphragm, IUDs, and uh, you also have the injections to prevent contraception. So uh, in other words, uh, when we talk about HIV prevention, I think PrEP like giving out Truvada is only one method for HIV prevention. So when, I, when we talk about demedicalizing PrEP, it basically means that uh, uh, you have to lower the threshold of uh, giving out uh, Truvada. And also, uh, you have to lower the threshold to get the STI and HIV testing. Now, in uh, some countries with rigid regulations, I think, uh, uh, prescribing is only allowed to doctors or nurse practitioners and testing only for uh, lab technicians. But uh, I think uh, that threshold should be lowered. Very interesting indeed here. Yeah. Um, so we are now focusing um, on um, some of the best practices that you shared with us and models that are effective. We really appreciate that. And also um, during this uh, part of the interview, shining a spotlight on demedicalizing PrEP. Thanks very much to you, Dr. Tanaguchi, for sharing some of the ways you think which works in, 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 in achieving that goal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much you. for joining much. us. Once again, we were just speaking to Dr. Toshibumi Taniguchi from the Department of Infectious Diseases at Chiba University in Japan. We now continue to the next topic, Thai Red Cross experience with PrEP. And we are now going to bring on stage Dr. Reshmi Ramautasing, Prevention Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Sawadika, Dr. Reshmi. Thanks very much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Yes, um, so um, Reshmi, you have um, inspired many of us among the audiences today um, that um, beyond just um, having a, a um, keyword of key population-led um, health services, you can actually um, demonstrate some innovative like sub models mm -hmm. of those um, like express mm -hmm. um, service um, um, as well as um, how you collaborate with private um, sectors uh, in order to, to try to have as many prep outlets as possible in the country. So I would like to hear more from you uh, on, on when you talk around um, the express service. Um, what is like the rationale behind you started to think about um, service needs to be expressed? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, I think in terms of the express, it's, um, it's a big picture, right, of service delivery. So on the one hand, you see, like I showed, that retention is not optimal. Um, then we see that community-based clinics are very busy. And we also see that the lay providers um, have a lot of things to do. And we actually uh, sort of use the idea of differentiated service delivery as well um, to come up with this express idea where if you can 
decide that these people don't need that much attention and can go through the service quicker and they don't need to talk to the counselor every three months, for example, then the counselor will have more time for those people who have questions about PrEP, who have not started PrEP yet, thereby facilitating more PrEP uptake. So it's different reasons, and I think that's, that really illustrates the importance of looking at your program from all angles and getting all of that information together to come up with service optimization ideas. Um, that's very, very nice um, to hear. And I think um, many countries may think of like, we have not yet started PrEP um, implementation. Um, we are not uh, yet ready uh, to, to talk about um, too many clients in yeah. our clinic. Right. Uh, we don't need to be expressed um, at, at this time. Yeah. Um, but, but you also mentioned um, one, uh, another like large um, service gap, uh, which is demand, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, risk awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, in which I think you, you see um, if we can frame um, the PrEP mm -hmm. uh, as, as a positive um, or, or, or a gain framing um, tool for health, mm -hmm. uh, that would really help um, increase the demand, mm -hmm. right? Uh, can, can you explain a bit more about that and, and, and uh, what would be a, a practical um, actions um, to do so? Okay, uh, so I think the, just to add a bit more to what I said, and just to summarize what I said is that we have loss framing, which is when you really just focus on risk and you rely on people to identify their own risk and then say, oh, I'm at risk, I need PrEP. And um, that potentially, or actually, that leads to people being left out. As I showed, a very large proportion of our clients don't see the need to use PrEP because they don't see themselves at risk. And gain framing is actually a concept that has been proven in HIV, no, not just HIV, in prevention behavioral research, and has showed that it is a more effective way to reach people who are not aware of their risk. Um, and so, like I said, it, it's not just something that we need to take into account for campaigning, but it should be a unified message that comes from all sides to the clients. So it's something that they see on TV, hear about on the radio, when they go see a doctor, that is something that should be t explained to them in that way. Um, and by focusing on, um, on, on health and on positivity and on taking care of yourself, you're much more likely that people will think, oh, that's actually something that I can also do to take care of myself. And the key here really is the consistency across all outlets to have one unified message. And I think the reason that I really want to pay attention to this concept is because I feel that in the region, the messaging is not uniform enough. There's lots of um, hesitancy around providing PrEP among PrEP providers. Um, and I think that could be potentially quite dangerous. So it's very important to get everyone on the same page so that we can have one message for our clients. Yes, I think that's um, very important um, um, as a, like an entry point or starting point of um, getting someone uh, to, to think about PrEP as an option mm. of, for health promotion. Yeah. Um, I um, feel that um, this could be, I mean, this is very easy to understand, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it could, could be quite um, challenging to be accepted, mm -hmm. especially uh, when you are talking about um, um, PrEP uh, in, in, a, in a health promotion way, because PrEP is kind of always be linked to sex, <laughs> and, and, and um, the, uh, how to have um, sex with the pleasant uh, of, of, of um, having sex may not be something that people in, in, in the society uh, would see as like the, the priority in life or in health. And, and when we say that um, uh, right now, uh, if you want to, to have a pleasant sex, um, the option for you to have that uh, with safety uh, is to um, use condom. 
but if you cannot use condom, now PrEP is also another um, option uh, for you. Or you can use it to get the double protection. Yeah. Um, for you to say this like as a medical doctor yes. uh, <laughs> to the society, uh, to someone who may have, um, uh, who, may, who may be parents of um, uh, adolescent kids uh, at home, uh, to say this to someone who are school teachers. Yeah. Um, how are you going to frame that? Um, and, and I know you are, you are from um, the Netherlands. Yes. <laughs> exactly. We are in the Asia Pacific. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I just want to learn from you. And, and I think um, the physicians, um, and, and um, especially those physicians who are social influencers mm -hmm. um, in, the, in our region, may be able to like, start thinking outside of the box and then and, 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 frame how they, they, they talk about PrEP um, yeah. um, in a better way. Mm. Yeah, yeah it's, um, that's, it's a very good point that you bring up, which is the, the difference between how we approach things in the Netherlands, right? Where I was trained there, we're very direct, and talking about sex with your kids is, is the norm. And, but that didn't happen overnight. It, it happened over decades, right? It, yeah, decades really. Um, and I think in the Asia Pacific, it's a very, even within countries, very different cultural situations. But I think we all need to start to realize um, that sex is normal. And maybe we are already realizing it, but we don't dare to say it. And um, we should start normalizing sex because from working on PrEP in Asia for so many years, I really feel that there is a moralizing component that's hindering the PrEP implementation and scale up. Um, so if we don't address that, if we don't start to talk about sex, normalize sex, and make sure that sex, having pleasurable sex is a priority in your life, or at least something that you pay attention to, um, then we can have many different models and we can have NHSO coverage but it will still be difficult to get people to realize um, that PrEP is a, a way to improve your sex life. So I would say start somewhere, start slowly, start like you actually mentioned yourself, start with influencers and start just talking to your patients as well about sex. Just ask, are you having sex? Who are you having sex with and how are you having sex? And is that going well for you? And I think just by asking that as a medical profession, uh, as a medical professional, you have a bit of a different role. So it, you take the lead in that and you tell people then this is okay for us to talk about. That's very interesting uh, <laughs> tips as uh, clinicians and professionals uh, to, to hear. Right, um, very true. I was actually very, very interested in this, and I think it is um, more difficult to normalize it, if you will, um, depending on the cultural context of each region, each country, etc. But um, just further emphasizing what Dr. Reshmi said, a unified message to create a unified, positive perspective of PrEP, and also um, pushing for it to be, say, a normal thing, linking it to health promotion. Yeah. Those were some of the key words which I picked up from that very, very interesting discussion. Thank you very much for offering ways to normalize it or make it viewed as more of like a positive, in a positive light. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Reshmi, for joining Open us. Care. And um, further talking about PrEP, scaling it up, making it a, a normal thing and we'll continue to talk about PrEP. We now have another guest who is going to join us. He's a familiar face. He, every year he joins us and I appreciate his presence and his knowledge, his expertise. Let's bring on Dr. Don Colby, Senior Clinical Research Physician at Search at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Hello, Swadika. You're well, I trust. Well I'm well, my ankle a little less yes. well. I had I an accident you yesterday. Were... Oh, but um, it's not too bad. Not, not too bad. Okay, yeah. well, speedy recovery. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. let's begin now. Okay. You always have so much to share. <laughs> I'm very happy to share. Well. <laughs> yes, um, Don touched uh, on two very important um, aspects 
uh, which I would say um, uh, uh, very common concerns uh, for PrEP implementation, which is um, the increasing, potentially increasing rates of sexually transmitted infections um, and um, HIV drug resistance uh, with, the, with the wider uh, scale up of PrEP. Um, so you, you mentioned um, um, a little bit at the end of the talk um, how to prevent um, uh, or, or how to like address um, these STI concerns and resistance concerns. So I think uh, with the time we have here, um, I would love you to um, expand uh, much more, um, maybe starting with the STI uh, okay. component first, yeah. um, because we we, we talked with um, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Tuvi Saab um, on how the uh, Thailand as as a country um, see the integration of PrEP under universal health coverage mm -hmm. as a way to like um, re-energize STI services in the country. Um, and, and I would love to, to hear from you more. Okay, yeah, thank you. So um, one thing I think that's important to note is that um, uh, we, with PrEP, we do see increased rates of STIs, um, but those increased rate, STI rates were actually increasing even before PrEP came out. PrEP's only been around for five years or so. Um, so STI rates were increasing for various reasons even before PrEP came out. So, uh, and that increase continues. And is, is PrEP causing that um, or partially causing or filling it? We don't know, uh, but, but we do know that STI rates are high. Uh, we also know that people are on PrEP because they have risk for HIV infection, and uh, HIV is an STI. So somebody at risk for HIV is going to be at risk for other STIs um, as well. So we can expect that our uh, patients who are put on PrEP are going to have high rates of STIs. So we know they have high rates at, at baseline, and we know as we follow them over time, they have high incidence rates um, as well. So the question is, is what can we do <laughs> about that? <laughs> Um, so uh, it's a good question, uh, and um, I think it's, it's, um, there's some limitations uh, based on resources, uh, on what's sort of possible and what's available. Um, so, so we have to think kind of what, what, is, what is sort of ne not only necessary, what is kind of feasible within the resources uh, available. Um, there's, there's kind of the two ends of the spectrum. One is like do nothing, which is what a lot of people have been doing <laughs> up until now, which we know is not enough. Uh, and then there's sort of the, the Western model is where you do everything where resources are not as much of a concern, and they do every test they can, like at every opportunity on every person that they can. So, and it's not an all, all, all or nothing, you know, we have to see like, um, you know, within the, the resources available, what is feasible. So I think for talk, specifically, specifically talking about maybe public programs or implementing PrEP, and thinking how can we integrate STI services into the PrEP services uh, as well. So I, I think um, you can start with the things that, that are, uh, very simple to implement uh, and don't necessarily need a lot of resources. So for example would be uh, syphilis testing. So syphilis we know is a very common STI, um, uh, very high rates everywhere that we look at it, particularly in high-risk populations like MSM and transgender women. Uh, syphilis tests now they're available in rapid tests that can be done on site uh, at a community-based clinic as well as in the hospital. Uh, and they're very inexpensive, maybe 50, 100 baht or something for, for one test. Um, so, so that would be the first place to start, to do two tests that are very easy to implement and, uh, and don't necessarily take a lot of resources. Um, and, and, and do those, could be every three months or six months or a year, whatever seems appropriate. Uh, and then add other STI testing onto that as availability. Um, in terms of, of um, message, mm. uh, keeping the message about um, HIV, PrEP, and STI out. Um, the, the concern that we are talking about um, PrEP um, and STI, uh, which could be addressed by saying that among PrEP users, we will encourage more condom use. So that probably no, not much worry about STI because people will be using condom mm -hmm. as well as um, PrEP right. in PrEP program. Right. Uh, that's, that's the message. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in reality, mm -hmm. uh, many people coming into PrEP program mm -hmm. um, has not been using condom mm -hmm. very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, they may 
decrease condom use over time um, when they uh, uh, are getting um, more confident with PrEP. Right, right. Um, how uh, you as a, as a doctor, as a PrEP prescriber, uh, will be saying um, or explaining this message um, to policymakers who may want to monitor um, PrEP use as well as condom use as well as um, STI um, incidents over time and, and say or hope that we will see increasing condom use with increasing PrEP use and with decreasing STI over time. How, 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 how are you going to explain this to the policy makers? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think our, our role as healthcare providers or as physicians, um, we, we can't like tell patients what to do. You can't, they're not like your, your four-year-old child who you can say, this is what you have to do and they're gonna do it. So I think our, our role as a healthcare provider is to um, tell people um, what the risks are and sort of what, what they can do to help their, to improve their own health and protect their own health. Uh, in the end though, it's up to the individual to decide I'm gonna do this or, or, or not to, to do this. Um, so I, I think that what we say is what we do is we give the information to our, our patients. It can be about PrEP and they decide whether they want to take it or not. Uh, we can tell them what the risks are for sexual behaviors and, and uh, what, what sexual behaviors may give a less of a risk for STIs uh, and how condoms can reduce their risk, both for HIV and other STIs. Uh, well, in the end, though, it's going to be up to the individuals um, to make that decision. And, and condom, condoms are very, very effective. We know they're very effective. So back in the 1980s or 1990s when we first had HIV in the West and in, in Thailand, and we didn't have treatment at that time, condom was really the only thing. Uh, and, and they worked. I mean, HIV rates went down dramatically, both in the Western countries and Thailand has been a very successful story with the 100% condom use uh, campaign that condoms, you know, in that context can work. Of course, it, it wasn't 100 percent. It didn't get us to 100 percent, right? But it got us, you know, 70 or 80 percent uh, of the way there. So we we can't expect one. We can never expect one modality, whether it's prep or condoms or anything else, is going to get us 100 percent to where we want to be in terms of protecting people's health. So we have to give people these are the different options you have, and how do we combine these options for each individual? And some individual, maybe condoms alone, if that's all they need to protect against all STIs. Some people maybe only use PrEP to protect against HIV, or some people might, might use both. But in the end, I think it's an individual decision, and our job as a healthcare provider is to help that person make the best decision for themselves by providing them with the, the correct information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, so I hope that uh, we will get um, to explain these to policy makers yeah, yeah. again and again to yeah. make them realize that um, it's no yeah. one's um, um, uh, best skill to convince mm -hmm. everyone to use condom uh, mm -hmm. all the time. Yes, and um, before we move to um, the resistance um, um, part, um, can I ask you to comment a little bit mm -hmm. on um, the STI test and treat? Mm -hmm. um, do you think that with PrEP program, mm -hmm. um, now we pay more attention to STI? Mm -hmm. uh, we screen more, we treat more rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, do you uh, feel that this could um, uh, somehow lead mm -hmm. us to like the ending or the elimination of mm -hmm. certain STIs um, mm -hmm. because of um, the PrEP program? Um, well, I think so, definitely. So I think by, by test and treat, you mean people may, may be asymptomatic, not necessarily mm, have yes, a, so uh, we're testing for STIs in people who don't have symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is basically how we went for HIV, mm. right? Yes. <laughs> and that's, and we, we basically decided in order to end HIV and AIDS, we have to do test and treat because people can have the disease but not have any symptoms or manifestations and not know. And that's definitely true of STIs mm -hmm. uh, as well. So yes, it, definitely in, in terms of um, if we want to end STIs, all of them are one at a time, then I think a, a test and treat approach is, is definitely going to be necessary. Um, and in, in some individual populations, I think we do that already. So for example, for pregnant women, right, for pregnant women because the STI is a risk not only to the mother but to the baby, so we have a test and treat approach, right? Every pregnant woman should be tested for STIs. Um, and I think that's very successful in, in eliminating, basically eliminating um, infant STIs that are passed from the mother to the child. So if we want to talk about eliminating STIs in the community among adults, then I think a test and treat approach is going to be necessary.
very much. Um, so now we may want to touch on the resistance um, part. Um, you um, laid out very um, beautifully how resistance uh, could happen uh, within within a prep program. Um, and I think that addressed um, some concerns uh, from uh, mainly infectious disease doctors um, that with the like the larger scale um, the prep program is then the larger uh, problem um, drug resistance will be. Um, so would you like to to like um, um, briefly summarize um, the the um, places where resistance could happen in prep yeah. program and then um, to mm -hmm. to um, advise give an advice to countries mm -hmm. um, uh, which are going to start prep rollout um, very soon on how they should like prevent um, mm -hmm. resistance at those um, steps yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, sure sure so I think the first thing to, to um, remember is that the only way to get resistance to HIV to get resistance is to get HIV first. Mm -hmm. Right, so by, by preventing HIV, that is the best way to prevent resistance, is to prevent HIV infections. So we know from surveillance in, in uh, many countries throughout the world, um, in, in most places, resistance to HIV drugs is about five to 10%. So five to 10% of people who newly get HIV infection, um, that HIV has already has some resistance uh, to drugs. And we have a lot of drugs, so we can always find another drug to, to treat them with. But if there's you know, millions of people um, in the world have HIV, then that five to 10% is hundreds of thousands or millions of people who have some resistance already out there in the community. Um, so, so we, with PrEP, um, though, it's, it's a little different issue because the, the person who's starting um, uh, PrEP, which is an ARV drug, the same drug we use for treatment, um, uh, they don't have HIV infection, right? So if you, and if you don't have HIV, then there's no risk for that, um, for that resistance to develop. But there's a few small uh, scenarios where resistance could happen. So um, we know that, that uh, from the time somebody becomes infected with HIV until their HIV antibody test becomes positive, it can be about two to four weeks, we call the window period. Um, so if somebody comes in for, wants to start PrEP, they have high-risk behavior, wants to start PrEP, um, during that window period, their test will be negative. They will meet all the criteria to start PrEP, the test they have on that day is negative, but in fact they do have HIV infection, the test is not, not positive. So if that person takes um, PrEP drug, um, which the PrEP drug is enough to prevent HIV but not to treat HIV, so the high risk for um, HIV resistance to come in in that scenario. Um, another possibility is, as I said, there's, there, there's resistant virus out there in the community. If somebody on PrEP is exposed to a virus that already has resistance, um, then the PrEP's not going to, um, to, uh, um, to protect them in that scenario. That, that is extremely, extremely rare. So uh, uh, to date in the whole world, there's only been six cases um, of that uh, identified. One case we identified here in, in Patia, in, in Thailand. Um, uh, but, but out of hundreds of thousands of people taking PrEP, only six cases of that happening. So that's extremely rare. It's not something I would worry about uh, on a regular basis. That other, what I said, mentioned before, somebody in that acute window period of HIV starting um, uh, uh, PrEP, it, it's not very common, but it's not that uncommon either. So when we looked at data um, at the Thai Red Cross um, and very similar data from other places, they come out with something about one out of 300 or one out of 350 people who start PrEP actually have acute HIV infection. So it's a small percent, you know, less than half a percent. Um, but but that, that's the, the scenario, you know, as we start more and more people on PrEP, that's the one where we're going to see more often um, and that may lead to resistance more often. But I think in the vast scheme of things, saying that there's already millions of people out there with resistant virus already, the number that are going to get um, resistance from PrEP is very, very small compared to that number who are going to get resistance from treatment of, of HIV. So um, thank you very much yeah. for pointing that out um, in, in, in details. Um, the last question uh, would be that you, you mentioned that um, in order to prevent resistance, mm -hmm. we may uh, uh, have to screen uh, for acute HIV mm -hmm. in a better way. Yeah. Uh, laboratory screening is yeah, one yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you may or may not be able um, yeah, to yeah. do so, uh, re, uh, mm -hmm. depending on uh, mm -hmm. your resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but clinical um, mm -hmm. screening of acute HIV infection, mm -hmm. could you please um, explain a bit more about that? Yeah, so, so I'm actually not, not a big proponent of clinical screening because I think it's very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we know that the, the symptoms of acute HIV mm -hmm. infection are very similar to a flu. 
Um, so with, with the background of flu that's, you know, in the, in the environment and the community um, uh, being much, much bigger than, than acute HIV infection, um, any screening is much more likely to bring up flu cases than HIV. So I, I think ra rather than, than, than necessarily screening for acute infection, uh, it's something we've discussed before and I, I've thought about is um, for people who may have an indication for PrEP, but we cannot rule out acute infection. So let's say that they've, they've had an uh, exposure, potential exposure to HIV within the last one month, and they could still be in that window period. So that, then I think the appropriate thing maybe is to put them on PEP. So, so PEP is three drugs prevention um, uh, that works after exposure, um, but, it's, but it, it turns out it's actually the same for treatment. So if we put them on PEP, we're actually on treatment uh, at that point. And then bring them back in a month. We always bring people back in a, in a month, whether it's PEP or PrEP, and then uh, test their antibody again. Because giving them that one month, is an, uh, that's enough time to get past the window period. And most, most people, not 100%, but it's going to be close to 100%, their antibody test will become positive within that extra month. Um, so you give them a month of, of PEP, which is basically ART. If their antibody test becomes positive, you just continue three drug ART. If the antibody test is negative, then you switch them to PrEP at that time. Thank you so much. Okay. Once again, a wealth of information, mm -hmm. a wealth of knowledge you just mm -hmm. shared with yeah. us, and we appreciate that, Dr. Don Colby, Senior Clinical Research Physician at Search Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center, discussing the perils of PrEP, STIs, resistance, as well as touching on screening there, mm -hmm. wrapping things up. You'll be back with me tomorrow, and I'm delighted. Yeah. I see that here on okay. my um, <laughs> agenda. Yeah. And um, that's going to wrap up today's okay. live okay. streaming session we also have to thank um, Dr. Nithya Panupak, also um, at SEARCH, the Chief of SEARCH at the Prevention Unit of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Thank you to you. And we are going to say goodbye to our viewers joining us, live streaming here. Join us again tomorrow beginning 10.30 a.m. It's bye from us here at the 22nd Bangkok International Symposium on HIV Medicine. Sawadee so ka.